welcome to Of the Publishing Persuasion. I am Angela Montoya. I am the author of Sinner's Isle coming out in, uh, I don't remember. Um, uh, oh, I do remember. I okay. I do remember. It's on my birthday. It's 10 31 23. Not my, I keep wanting to say like my birth date, which is an ancient in the 1900s. <laughs> you know, we won't, we, I'm not going to expose how old I am, but, um, but no, it's this year. So Sinners is coming out this year, everybody. And I hope you've pre-ordered it. Um, and if you haven't pre-ordered it, the ghost of Frangela <laughs> will haunt your dreams forevermore. <laughs> this is your official warning. You've been warned. <laughs> this space will be in your nightmares every night if you do not pre-order immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, for those who aren't watching, <laughs> Melanie is holding up a um a, a figurine doll with your likeness on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a doll with my face on it and for some reason she is wearing a yellow cardigan with white pearls. <laughs> She's in the presidential suite. <laughs> yes. You don't know, but someday I sh I might just be the president, and you know. So hold on to that figurine. You can sell that on eBay. Yes, um, America needs you. I yes, wish I could vote for that to happen. I'm sure our <laughs> listeners do too. <laughs> yes, please. I think I think we need to work on that. Um, put me in, coach. Anyways, I'm here with Melanie Schubert, <laughs> who um is just out here shining her light looking magnificent as always you know you just breathe goddessness <laughs> and um so how are you Melanie <laughs> I'm good oh, I I was like I don't know what it is about this jumper I think it's attracting bees which, <laughs> which and your you and your your freaking fingernails are very springy oh, they are very colorful I did a bunch of colors but um so, you know, like talking about phobias, I didn't reveal last week, but actually like oh. it's a real phobia of mine, bees and wasps. So when I laughed, oh. ha ha ha, that bees are being attracted to this jumper, I was in tears getting my coffee this morning because the fucking bees came for me. And it's like the third time I've worn this and every time a bee has come and I'm just like, they must think it's flowers. I don't know. May they just want to just want to suck that sweet nectar, right? <laughs> Yeah, they do. But no, it's like a real, like this is, I'm sharing my secret phobia with you. Well, it's not a secret, but like, no, because when I was a kid, my grandparents live on a farm and we used to have bees as well. We had a mini farm and they would take out honey, my family. They'd like, you know, get the honey from the bees. And like, you know, some bees are, are a lot more wild than others. So when you take the honey, they go berserk and I would have only been like eight or 10 and I didn't know what was happening outside. And I like wandered out and I had this long blonde hair when I was little and the bees were going nuts. So when I came out oh. unprotected, they swarmed in my hair, which was flapping in the breeze. So I had like oh, 20 no. bees in my hair, stinging my skull. <gasps> so it's real trauma. Like I can't quite, even as an adult, when they come, sometimes if they're, I can observe a bee on a flower and be like, cute, fine. But then <laughs> it comes for me or if I'm trapped in a small space, I get like a proper like fear, panic trigger. <laughs> and I have yeah. to really, really use all my self-care and anti-panic attack stuff to be like, <sighs> even oh, if it stings man. you, worst case scenario, it's not the end of the world. But like, yeah, it's like a knee jerk. I just thought you should know since you gave me monkeys and and yeah. like intelligent birds. I felt like you had a right to know it's thank you wasps for me. <laughs> thank you. I plan on using this against you in the future. <laughs> okay, but I might actually cry. <laughs> okay, okay. I won't send any bees your way. <laughs> no, you have a proper reason because that sounds terrifying in every which way. Um <laughs> yeah. yeah and those and it's not even that they're 
frightening they really hurt and so <laughs> you yeah yeah on, okay, your I, skull, on your skull like it hurts so much and I could hear them I could hear oh. them all swarming in my head it was, it's proper nightmare material <laughs> oh did you yeah. ever see the movie my girl no is okay it well don't 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 watch it never mind no and even yeah. that there's that um is it a marvel character i don't know that's like made up of bees i can't even look at it <laughs> oh no it's like some bee man it must be a horror movie para would know para would know there's something that... anyway <laughs> i oh, digress <laughs> can't was can't candy man I mean, he's not a superhero. Do you remember the movie Candyman? It must be that. Well, I didn't watch it. Oh. I couldn't even look at the poster. Oh, well, maybe it's not that then. But, like, I remember as a kid watching Candyman. Mm. And, like, the bees were, like, part, like, it's been a long time since I've seen it. But, like, it was, it's horrifying. And I had that. very many nightmares over Candyman. Yeah. Um, as you would. So, so Yes. But I mean, like, I don't think bees were like his thing, but he would like come through your mirrors into your like bathroom. If you, you know, you know, like Bloody Mary, like if you say it three times. Really? Do you know this? Do you no. know this one? No, but oh. I'm about to learn, aren't I? <laughs> yes. So I think Candyman's the same, but Bloody Mary, there's all these random myths, right? But yeah, like as kids, every kid probably in America would go in like when you had sleepovers you'd go into like your friend's bathroom and you'd shut off the lights and you have to say bloody mary three times and she would come through and like get you you know and That's obviously crazy. she didn't but you know it was like that thing that you just scare everybody scares your you know but um uh, candy man was that also for me <laughs> yeah. um so we'll stay away from bees then stay away from bees <laughs> yeah yes and, okay so Oh no. Yeah, I agree. I, bees are not, I mean, obviously we need them. Yes, I know. Save, save we just need. No, save. I love them from afar, just not <laughs> up in my grill. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know what? I support that. I agree. They need to learn they need where they need to be. Exactly. What were you going to say? Are you going to tell me another phobia of yours? <laughs> well, I have a new one. Um, I didn't realize this was, oh, so we went to the aquarium yesterday. I and, saw um, that and I was so confused. Yeah. At first I was like, oh, she's really loving the Marie. Cause you also put reels up of like random shit. And so it <laughs> oh, yeah, like, I guess really I loving something. the Marine theme today. And then I clicked like, oh, she's at the aquarium. <laughs> yeah. I guess I should have, I, maybe I should have captioned it better, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, we went to the aquarium and. And the, there was, there was octopus, octopi, octopussies in, in, you know, they were there. <laughs> and I was, lo <laughs> and I was looking at this, these, these son of a bitches. Okay. Listen, they were suctioned up to the, like the, the, the wall, the corner. Yes. And their little tentacle things were like looking all gross, yes. but then, you know, they're like hanging upside down. And there, my son goes, my son's 13. He goes, looks like a giant ball sack. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and he said it in front of this busy place. I love that. And I was like, you know what? He's right. It looked like <laughs> a giant ball sack from hell. Like, so new fear unlocked being out in the ocean and a giant ball sack coming at you. Yeah. But they're no, up, they're giant ball sacks with evil eyes. Have you seen their eyes yes. though? They oh. you know, they're very smart. They're smarter than like parrots and stuff, I think. So when you look at him, it's not like old Mr. Goat. There's not vacant eyes. He's there, he's thinking, he's planning <laughs> his ball sack life. <laughs> and how they like like they teach octopus octopi. They teach octopi stuff to no, do they don't. like monkeys. They'll grab things and like <laughs> I want to cry right now because that's <laughs> terrible. Up. You want... I'm going to send you smart octopi video later. <laughs> I don't think they're as smart as monkeys. That's probably fake news, but apparently they are quite clever, like surprisingly clever. But you're not the only one. Like a lot of people have a deep fear of the sea. Like when I got my yeah. hair cut the other day, my hairdresser was like, he's like, I do not go. Like I, I don't swim. And I was like, what? Why? 
he's like oh he's like if I'm gonna go he's like I'm not gonna go that way he's like I like I want to see what I'm facing <laughs> like he <laughs> truly has this fear of like these deep which yeah. animals, we've seen we've all seen the movies you know <laughs> well it's hard to fight off a shark you know what I mean it's hard to fight off an octopus they're taking you down like a kangaroo Especially here you know we've got blue ring octopus. do you know that what the hell's what is that are just another creature to add to your list of a bomb <laughs> alien. Like it's one of the most deadly creatures in the world, blue ring octopus. So they Why? live. What does rocks. it do? It can kill you like a snake. Like it's very highly venomous. It's one of, I, I was going to say it's one of the only venomous ones in the world, but realistically I wouldn't have a clue, but it's as, as far as I know, it's one of the most venomous. I didn't even, I don't think most other octopi are not, venomous in any way people eat them but the blue ringed one it, when it gets mad these blue rings light up on its arms and it's full of toxic venom like neurotoxin like fucking snakes oh my god yeah oh but they're god. not where they're not in melbourne they're in like the warmer waters anything up towards darwin cans I would also be hesitant to enter the water there. When I was a flight attendant and we used to do like a stopover in Dar with like overnight in Darwin because it's like such a long flight because Australia is so big, you know, like it's on, it's like yeah. a massive flight to Darwin. Well, comparatively to like a small country. And so we'd overnight there. And I remember I had no clue because I grew up in Melbourne, but like you can't swim in the beaches in Darwin. There's like toxic jellyfish. There are great white sharks just swimming about. There's saltwater crocs in the sea. In, oh in God. The sea. And they lay around in like, you know, like other parts of not right in town, but sometimes they wander into town as well, I think. Like there's warnings Susan. everywhere. So the only place we could swim was right by the hotel. They'd put like a, there's like a net to stop all the creatures <laughs> that would come in. So that would want to kill you. A restricted sea area. But yeah, there's they very much warn against swimming in um open Darwin waters. So that's where the blue rings are, apparently. Man. Yeah. Well, good to know because <laughs> my ass won't be over there. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to see one in the ocean, let alone a blue ringed asshole they're, they're that could tiny. kill me. They're tiny. They're but... tiny. They're tiny. Yeah. That's mm. even worse. Yeah, like a spider. It's like, well, not that <gasps> small, but they're like pretty small. I'll show I you. Died in, I just died. I just died inside. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Well, Straya, mate. Straya. <laughs> Straya. Straya. <laughs> I'm just like, <sighs> go to New Zealand. New Zealand is like the opposite of Australia. Like the most venomous thing in New Zealand is like, I don't know, probably some kind of shell or something. I don't even I don't even know if they have venomous spiders. Like Australia has all the freaking evil creatures. <laughs> go to New Zealand New Zealand for vacation, everybody. Yeah. Don't go to Australia. Well, well, that's good to know. Thank you for that. Um <laughs> how have you been? Good. I it's it's funny because if I feels like forever since we've done this, which yeah. I don't think it's been that long but um like anytime week. we don't see each other for like a week I'm like wow it's been a month yeah um but no I've been great I went to our dear friend Maria Jose Fitzgerald's book signing yes and it was so ugh, like I brought my daughter and even she was just like just overwhelmed with the sweetness because oh there were kids there some kids that showed up because she had gone to like a school and done a presentation and so a few kids from there went and then some other kids and like they were asking her questions about her book and like about writing and it was the sweetest like time just to watch her interact with kids that are that are going to read or have read her book um so, and that's where I got uh, Ari's book, who's our guest today, was there. And I believe they're either agent siblings or agency siblings. I was going to um, say, I wasn't 100% sure, but when she said the name, I thought I remembered that that's also Maria's agent. Yeah, yeah. So I was just like, oh, perfect. Because I'm pretty sure that's what Maria uh, mentioned. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it was so, so special Well, to, for one, to see her in person. Mm -hmm. Um. 
And I thought, oh, it's going to be a little weird, but it really isn't because when we get to Zoom like this, it's mm -hmm. really so personal. And like having her on, she's so amazing and magical and sweet. And she was just that way in person. And so I was just like, I'm, I'm in love with Maria Jose Fitzgerald. But yeah, it was great. It was really, really fun to see her in action. Mm. To like do a bookish thing it was really fun. I'm so glad. I love to hear it because it's like, I think sometimes our kind of personality is it's overwhelming to just think of going to stuff like that. But like something I find over and over again is in the right spaces. It doesn't take all the energy. It also gives something back, you know? And of course it would be yes. like her event because she's such a big hearted person and like her energy is so good. So when you go into those spaces, like even if it does take a bit of your social cup, but it also like, it doesn't leave you completely depleted. It's like different. Yeah. Like it, it yes. sort of fills you up with something as well. It did. It really did. And I was like, I need to do more of these. Um, Good so, work. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. How are you? What are you up to? What's what, what's new with you? Oh, mate, it's honestly <laughs> like the last few weeks have been a real. You got a real oh, mate out of me, Aussie mate. <laughs> yeah, you did. I did. I feel I feel honored. <laughs> yeah, it comes out every now and then. Yeah, the last few weeks have been interesting. Like a suspicion I've had that I might be ADHD has like the universe has been giving me a lot of signs, and at first I was kind of like nah, like that can't be right. Like that's probably like not like I've lived my whole life and I've never thought about that. But like actually weirdly enough, Instagram reels have been educating me. And like at yeah. first it was just like kind of laughing at a few quirky ones. But honestly, like it's kind of surreal to realize that I probably really am and not just to a small degree, like to a high degree. And it's like, so it's been like this kind of weirdly emotional, but like validating seeing all this stuff and like stuff that I kind of just thought was like normal people stuff. And I'm like, no, it's not like stuff everyone struggles with. It's like very well might be like neurodivergence. So it's been like wild. Like even like to this morning, I was thinking like stuff. And, and I think like it's actually been helpful for my for like living with anxiety and being like cutting myself some more slack, giving myself more grace. Yeah. I think that's why I'm looking into it more because I realized that stuff that like I was really hard on myself for or that I would like beat myself up for might just be the way my brain works. Like even like yes. getting ready for the pod, honestly, like three hours. I'd like three hours ideally to like shower, walk the dog, feed myself and like I would always feel ridiculous about that, but that's just like an ADHD thing because I get so easily distracted. Even just going to get my coffee, I was like, got, I've got half an hour, 45 minutes. The cafe is five minutes away. Dude, I was power walking home. I do not know <laughs> where my time went. I didn't even stop to talk to anyone. So just like all these random things. But yeah, I don't know like if I'll get, I did like an online test and I'm, I'm test as high. Hi, <laughs> so it's a thing I don't know if I'll go get the official testing or not but yeah it's it's weird it's like validating and yeah it's a it's a new journey for me and it was kind of cool in yes. our discord group that like I realized like a bunch of us probably are like it is quite common these days especially amongst creatives who like our brains are like melting pots of it was cool in the discord we were all popping off like the little neuro spicy crew. <laughs> That's it. I love that phrase so much. Neuro Same. spicy. And I think it's freeing almost like you were saying, it's like, and it's kind of one of those things where you're like, it all just clicks, you know, little bit by little bit of just like, Oh, wait a minute. You know? Um, yeah. Like I don't have to fight this so much because it's just how I am. And yeah, there's like techniques, but like, it's that acceptance of like, no, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just that that's just how my brain works. You know, if, if that makes sense, it's like less of a judgment, which I think we all put on ourselves. hundred percent. And that's, yeah. And I think initially I was really hesitant to label it, like to give, put like a specific label on it until like, yeah, exactly that. I just started realizing that some stuff like, 
when I'll pop off the most and get like angry, like at my husband, it's because of, it's like 98% of the time, it's because of sensory overload, especially if we're Mm. out. And like, I've learned a million coping tools to deal with this shit, you know, or some people would say a lot of it is masking techniques, right? Like mask the behavior to fit into normal society. And it, and it's also probably why I get so exhausted in social situations because I've got a million masking techniques. And so it all feeds into anxiety as well. So that's kind of why I'm dissecting it a bit more so I can understand how does it affect anxiety? How does it, you know, like I've learned these tools, but now even more like just having these conversations, I'm just like, wow, like, yeah, like I can cut myself. Cause I would beat myself. I'm like, gosh, like, am I a tyrant? Like I'm popping off at nothing, you know? But it's like, no, we've been in like the city and it was so busy and now I'm overwhelmed and then I got rained on and it's wet and now I'm sticky and people want to talk, you know, like whatever it is, it builds, builds, builds. And Too like, much. For the neuro spicy brain, it's like the next thing <laughs> and with your safe person, you're going to pop off, you know. So, yeah, lots of little yes. things like that to be continued. But, yeah, like for now it seems pretty – um. It seems pretty obvious. Everything I'm kind of passing through the new filter and I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought that was just, I thought everybody suffered (laughs) in these areas. They don't, they don't. (laughs) (laughs) So so watch this space. I don't know. (laughs) You don't have to suffer in silence anymore. We are here along with you on your journey and our discord because it's everybody. As soon as one person mentioned it, everybody was like, yep, me too. hundred yeah. percent. And <laughs> I think I it's love. almost a bit of a hesitance to like lay. I definitely was like, oh, so many people like coming out saying this, but like, yeah, in creative spaces again, and like people tend to be drawn to each other because you get how each other's brain works and you make space. Yeah. So neurospicy people tend to have a bunch of neurospicy friends. So I hear Oh yeah. <laughs> feels right. It feels right. It feels right. <laughs> it feels right. <laughs> so now when I like running too much into conversation and stuff, I'm like, oh, it's like that's a thing. That's like <laughs> no, that's like a major thing. Feeling like yeah. if you don't say what you needed to say right now. Like I've worked hard. I have worked hard to get it down to where it is now, believe it or not. <laughs> Oh, anyway, you've been doing the work. You have been doing the work, Valade, and I, I'm here for. I'm here for all of this. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you, You're a good friend. Now, tell me about your work. What your? How's your whip going? Your whip whap. My whip. My whip whap is going. <laughs> um, it's going good. I, yeah. It's not going as like it's not going as good as I'd like it to go just because I got busy because I got past pages for sinners. Yes, Idol. You did. Um, I did. And so I, I whipped those out. Like I finished it pretty fast because I wanted to get back to my new project because it's more exciting right now. Cause I've read sinners aisle 5,000 million billion quadrillion times. Um, and so I always have a crisis when I reread sinners aisle, like mm. I need to change. Let's just trash the whole book. Let me just rewrite it all. <laughs> I've learned, I've learned since then. Um, but no, so I'm, I'm done for now with past pages and all of that. And so I'm back on my new whip. Um, I'm at like almost 20,000 words. Ooh, I can so... see that, that. You better watch Oh, it. so how what? are you? You are way further ahead. I'm like at almost at 16. I thought you were f- way further ahead, but I can catch you still. I can... You can try. So do not slow down, my friend. Do not slow down. I won't. I won't. And um, now I know. I know you said a bunch of people are reading Sinner's Isle now. Yes. Yes. We have sent it off to like authors for blurbs. Yeah. And so I just got another uh, blurb this morning from an author (laughs) and I cried. (laughs) Do you want to read it? Um, Can you? I. The secret. I don't. I don't think it's a secret because on here, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Only if you want to. You You just share whatever you want. No, I want to. Yeah. I I cried. 
Yes. I no, because I asked my editor, Bria, like, if mm. are we allowed to share these things? And she was like, Well, I mean, if you want to, it's fine, but usually like closer to, you know, pub date, so that can lure people in. So um listeners, if you get to listen in, that means you have to pre-order. You yeah. know what I mean? That means <laughs> Angela's watching as well. Like. Yeah. So here, I'll read it. I'll read it. Um, <clears throat> do you want to know who it's by first or should I say it after? Oh, oh you, I don't know. Surprise me. Whatever you feel. <laughs> okay. So um, it says, well, I'll just tell you. It's from Ma Marie Lou, who is a New York Times bestselling author of Stars and Smoke and um, the Legend series. Do you know that one? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so it's by, uh, so it, the blurb is from the author Marie Lou. Uh, Google her. Okay. <laughs> um, and it says, I love this adventure set on high seas and magical isles of star-crossed love between a headstrong witch and a dashing pirate and of two friends with an unbreakable bond. What a refreshing, visceral experience. You can't help but devour this tale smiling and cheering for our heroes the entire way through i thought that was great <laughs> that's glorious <laughs> well-deserved praise of a glorious book so now everybody has to pre-order that you've heard that i mean how do you not yeah that's yeah. a sneak peek of things other people won't hear until promo time that's right that's right yeah. melanie blessed yeah. to hear it upon their ears what about um my vampy my vampy bow when are we getting hearing anything about know. that i don't know i'm waiting to get some edits for mm. book two but um who knows how that will go but either way like i'm really excited to get back onto that book because it's a really really fun book and so yes, yes. So it's so fun. just gonna keep on moving. Keep but on hopefully moving. not too soon because I think it would be good if you get this. Not like not that not that it matters what I think, but I was just in my <laughs> dream world. You would want to have time to draft this out now, and then yes, yes, after. that would be ideal. Exactly. Let's. I want to beat you in draft race and all of our friends on our Discord, and then I'll get back to it. So you can try. I shall. And what I'm are you reading, reading now? Are you reading anything? Actually, yes. I'm listening to The Seven Faceless Saints by N.K. Uh -huh. Bob. Yes, Dude. Everywhere. It's so, as it should be, it's so yeah. good. It's so good. Her, her writing, I had to slide into her DMs. Yeah. Um, Just like I did with Flower Heart, um, because it's so good. It's just like, yes. Thank yeah. you. Uh, just smart writing. So smart. How about you? Are you? What are you doing? What are you up I'm to? I'm reading what are you Court's reading? book. I'm reading Court's book. I've started Court's and finishing Kyla's. I was impatient to start Court's book. So I'm like blessed with, and, and I have to agree with Ari. Like I, I also am trying to claim my slow reading lately. I think it's another thing for ages. I've been like, actually, I always thought I was a fast reader and I am when reading is all I'm doing. But reading yeah. is a split task with a bunch of other stuff in the day. Like I'm actually super slow. But yeah, I my ear holes are currently ultra blessed. And I just honestly like when I read other books, I'm just like, no, our friends' books are better. I don't know if you feel like that lately. But I so many times I pick up another book and I'm then I'm just it's almost like a sigh of relief. Like the these books are so good. So I'm reading, yeah, Courtney's lovely divine glorious book in the case of heartbreak burn falls number two it's so yummy and it's so it's such a big wonderful hug of like all the good things yes and yes yeah I feel so honored to read it early and just like I actually have been listening to it before I go to sleep and it's putting me to sleep, not because it's not interesting, because it just it's like such a feeling of comfort, you know, as you read yeah. it. It's so, a joyful book. Yeah. Sure. It's my mind yes. in a really peaceful place. And then I'm able to just like. Mm, I love that. Well, speaking of peaceful and joyful and magical. Let us introduce our amazing guest, uh, Ari Tyson, because, wow, we had the best time chatting with her. 
Um, and my computer is about to die. So if you want to in intro yeah. Ari, yeah, I will. in case I disappear. I will. And I was honestly just tearing up again, just thinking like her feedback was honestly the highest, like you said, the highest praise that I could ever hope to hear about. Like, I feel a bit emotional about it. I don't know how that takes, because it's just what you hope that like listeners will come on the show and feel like it's a safe place as well. You know, like the feeling I get reading mm -hmm. Courtney's book, I want people to come on here and feel that here safe and like yes. seen and valued. So it just, yeah, I'm so pleased that she did. And you're just a legend at getting on good energy people. So I will read this amazing bio. Ari is a Bri Bri, Indigenous Costa Rican, American and African descendant poet, and the author of YA hybrid poetry and prose novel, Saints of the Household, 2023, and another YA, 2024, with FSG Macmillan. She's a contributor in Our Shadows Have Claws, which I have here. This okay. glorious tone, which also has our legendary boo, Amparo. Mm -hmm. Um and a YA folklore and horror Latin anthology with a long run young readers and forthcoming in relit anthology of classic retellings with a Latin lens with HarperCollins. Her poems and short works have been published in Yellow Medicine River, The Under Review, Rock and Sling, and Poetry's first ever edition for children. She was the winner of the 2018 Baunda, Baunda, Baunda Miko Nicholson Award. Yeah for BIPOC writer with Learner Publishing. She is on faculty at Hamline's MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults program. Well, ladies and That's gentlemen, yeah. let's get Ari on. Yeah, and your ear holes will be blessed with all her wisdom. Actually, my um, my sister from another Mr. Niece. <laughs> I didn't say that right. My... Like, <laughs> One of my closest friends, my other Angela, her daughter's called Ari as well. So it's like a special Aww. name. So it's, I don't know why, but it always brings me so much joy when the name of someone I love is like also in another good energy person. Just mm. like, oh, like two of my closest people in the world are like both Angela's and it's so bizarre, but it's just like you know, that name holds like good energy and good. Do you know what I mean? It's weird, eh? Yes. I need to start searching for some Melanie's around here. <laughs> One of a kind. Oh. oh. <laughs> that was quick right there. <laughs> it's true. It's Sometimes true. Old ADHD brain is good for something. We're very funny. <laughs> crafty? Some might call us crafty. Are you still watching RuPaul's? Of course I am. I mean, fuck. I just thought for a second, we haven't discussed it in ages. I was like, I hope you're up to date. I'm up to date, baby. I am up to date. Okay, you watched the last one, Melanie? No, I haven't. The, the oh, last okay. one is the only one I haven't seen. I was oh, curious okay. if you had, like, stayed in with the, like, how deeply were you invested? I am in. Oh, I, I am in. I am invested. Yeah. Yes. It's so good. They're, they're the queens are so talented. I am obsessed. Anitra, is that Anitra? Anitra, yes. Anitra's I actually, I yeah, I, Anitra is my I, I gotta say is my favorite. Mm. And Mistress, she is such a bitch, and I love Mistress. Yes. Mistress is like in my heart, quintessential drag queen. Yes. Mistress is the one I would want to see tomorrow. You know, like there's yes. this, like this energy that's like so just sass queen, just oozing with sass, but like also like a really big heart in there as well, I think. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm. I'm trying. To, I love them all. I, there's not one that I'm just like, oh, I, could, I wait. I want to see them go. I, I think they're right. all great. And I love I love like the quiet moments where they're just getting ready and they're talking about their life stories. And it's I just like, I would ugh. love that part. That's the part I felt like all the stories, like, cause yeah, like I, that's how I just, I would, my soul just needed you to love it. Cause it's that <laughs> it's 
stupid humor that like yes you no know, tits and balls humor but then like the next minute like it's like real like real stuff yes. and like I think that balance and being able to share it is what like really allows us to connect as humans mm-hmm. you know and yes show is just like I just it's think beautiful. that show is like one of my like spiritual guides in this world you know <laughs> I know no it's a beautiful heartfelt show and it you know especially in the states right now not in all states because as I, I'm sure if you're from the states, states especially you understand like each state is its own basic country yeah. but in the states many not many but some states are trying to like ban drag shows I at the very that. at this very moment yeah. and like and then also like you know like transgender rights all of these things yeah. are like in in dispute and it boggles my mind and it ra- and enrages me yeah. because it's like why not let beauty be why not let people live their authentic selves and I think it's just because people are afraid I and have- so watching stuff like RuPaul you know it like opens your mind and you can see into the human side of things so so damn it obviously I'm I can guarantee you our listeners are not <laughs> are not on that side of things I can guarantee yeah. you but you know, it's just we're it's just it boggles my mind. It pisses me off. Yeah. So. yeah, like understandable. We had some fucked up rally in the city that like I didn't even know about until after like anti-trans something. But like it was beautiful to see. Like the next week, there was the opposite rally. A huge one came Good. out. But like it made me sick. I was like Melbourne of all places. Like right. You know, I could walk out any day and see a cute queer couple holding hands. And I always feel so proud to live somewhere where they they can be safe to walk hand in hand down the street, you know? And so I I like, I was like emo for a while after, because I was just like, not Melbourne, not like, don't you dare fucking come with your, I agree what you said though. It's fear. It's like a trigger fear response of something unknown, you know, Mm. ignorance is, it is. Yeah. Well, just like just like Ari said in our interview, chase the joy and let's live in love and don't live in fear. She's here, so I'll just let her right in. Hi Ari, it's so good to see you. Um like thank you for joining us. It, I was I was just laughing with Melanie um a second ago because I literally my brain had this moment of panic of like, wait, what time zone is everybody? And I thought I had it wrong, but it was we got it. So Good deal. Yeah, I know time zones. It's like once you start doing this stuff, it's like, oh, it's like the biggest fear, like that something's going to go wrong, you know, but I I heard some. So Melanie, are you in Australia? Is yeah. that what you just Oh my gosh. Thank you for like no night thing with me. I appreciate it. My husband's a musician, so all of his stuff is in the evening. So we and we live like next door to grandparents so we can like sometimes pass off the baby, but like it worked out really well today because he had some less less stuff so he could hang out with the kiddo. So I appreciate y'all willing to make it later and stuff like that. So no, no it's our absolute pleasure. Yeah. And it's I thank goodness for grandparents because our my um my partner's parents live across the road from us. And my I don't I don't know if I would be able to to survive if we didn't have you know so thank god you know like they say it takes a village it really freaking does sometimes it does it totally I can't imagine uh we lived in the cities where I grew up for a while and then when we had the baby it was like no I think it was either we kept trying to live the lifestyle we did and then we wouldn't be happy because we wouldn't get to do the things we loved or we lived next to resources and family there it is (laughs) but no I'm we're so honored to have you I was just I was just looking at your book right now. I um I was at a like a really amazing indie bookstore last on Friday and I saw this and I was like thumbing through it. Um and it is so cool how it's formatted. My I I, I don't because we also do this, like we'll post this on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know if you guys can, you know, it's just really, really cool how everything is I mean I'm sure if you I'm sure hold on let me look because I was just and just reading oh my god 
like just thumbing through some of your passages in this book is stunning and um so I'm in awe of you right now because I you do that that means a lot <laughs> That cover yeah. is mind blowing. It's so striking. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The team did Can amazing. we get into? I, I I mean we're we're already recording and we're we're already going to introduce you and stuff like that. But I just want to get into this real quick about I know it's not even on our question things, but where did the inspiration for this amazing cover come from? The cover, yeah. I um, you know, we there was three different artists, um that we were kind of deciding between. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, I don't know, I Jazz, I guess, had a vision with Trisha Privet, um, who was the designer at the time. And um, I don't even know how they came up with the concept, but the two, it's it's about two brothers. Um, and then I sent in some pictures of Brew Bree, uh, young men, one of, you know, my cousin and, you know, a few family members and things like that. And so I think she kind of, took those inspirations and kind of created them as who they are. And there's a lot of really like hidden imagery in it too. That was really cool. Um, not hidden, but you know, like she's got coded colors on their cheeks that correlate with the book and their images on their cheeks, like correlate with who they are too. Like there's a lot, the hair looks like water because of like the metaphors. And so she like, she went all out, like jazz went all out on like the meaning behind it I'm I just feel really honored and <laughs> like it feels like a poem to me like because it's so like it's so metaphorical um but yeah <laughs> well you can That's score gorgeous. that just looking at it even though I didn't know all the hidden meanings behind it I found myself just staring at it for ages because there's like so much that yeah your yeah. eye is just drawn to all the little bits so yes well, tell yeah, us a little bit about yourself. Did you always, where did it start for you? Did you always want to be a writer? Yeah, I think, you know, I think I've always been a storyteller in some way or another. Um, I think for me, it started in theater. Mm. Um, I think, you know, like a little kiddo, because I was, I guess I, my mom's story is that I could memorize picture books really fast. And then she, she was like, oh, she's got a memorizing skill. I don't have that anymore. I wish I did. <laughs> um, uh, but at the time, I have, so she thought that would and I was really extroverted and loved to you know dance and like I was probably I would I'd like say I was like the pink boa child like that kind of kid but probably really obnoxious like I would be like annoyed by my younger self but um but she was she was really into that kind of stuff and she loved to theater and being in front of folks but I think as I have gotten older and matured and found that my art firm actually needed to be pretty quiet into myself and needed to be a safe space for me um, where I'll, I feel like writing is so personal and quiet and you need that, you just need that space between you and the page. Um, and that's where I think why I landed it because that's what my soul needed. And so that's where I, I always, I always get to be when I, when I write. Um, so yeah, from storytelling, right, it goes in a lot of different places, but that's, that's the one that I landed on because I think it's, yeah, it's what I needed. Ooh. I was just watching Melanie just like react physically to that. And I just love it. Uh, I love it. And it's it's interesting because it's like so often the world is so chaotic and we can be so chaotic. And to find that thing that brings you peace and like quiet, um, I think it's just like, it's invaluable. Like it's precious and, um, you know, and it manifested into this gorgeous peace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like, something that helped you will also be, you know, something that people will cherish as well. And I just, I love that about writing and craft mm -hmm. and um, in particular writing because it, because theater is so out there and you're, mm -hmm. you know, exposing yourself in such a different way, but writing, I love how you said that. It's like this quiet kind of like thing that you just put your, you breathe into a page and, um, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I was watching Melanie. And yeah, <laughs> you, know me too, you know me too well now. You can read my face like a book. There's so much I resonate with in that. And just like, I think it's just, it's it's a thing, right? Like writing, I resonate with that part that like, you know, some of those loud, shiny things initially drew you to creative life, but then the the need in your soul for the quietness of writing to like, dissect your thoughts I resonate with that so hard in my entire core 
that I'm just like, yeah, it, and it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to hear that like these mysterious forces that draw us to creative writing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's it, absolutely a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, what do I tell some of my students? I, I, and I can't even remember where this is from, but you know, the, the, that like the act of writing comes out of like the narrative of your life in some way or another. And so like, you Claire Rudolph Murphy I was like quote her all the time but she you know and so when we think about writing it just narrates you know whether you write in fiction or fantasy or you know you might not even notice it by at the time but when you look back at it you often see that there are these kind of parallels to what you needed at the time um mm. which I think is really cool uh you know to even look back at old projects and be like oh my gosh yes um and maybe being more like old, being a little older and, you know, working on the next bigger books, you're just more conscious of it. Um, and, and that's also like a different type of thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think process is so fascinating. I'm always so curious to hear writers talk about it because I think it's different, but also very sa- the same for a lot of us in terms of like the, the elemental stuff, like the deep, the deep stuff, that stuff is pretty similar. Yes. And, you know, you always hear that, that quote, like, write what you know. And if you take it literally, you're like, well, I don't know much, but it's not even yeah. that. It's like, write what you've experienced. <laughs> you know, it's like, write what, what work you have been doing in your own heart and soul and what has affected you. And that will bleed into the story. And and I find that too, like, even in my own books, like, you can always tell what sort of issue I'm battling <laughs> at that moment, you know, like, what sort of whatever it is. And then I just kind of put it into that and and learn how to fix these things or, you know, work on them through my characters, you know, kind of gives you that buffer of, well, I'm not there yet, but let's put them through it and see how they survive, you know? Oh. And and then um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Less writers. <laughs> yeah, right, I love it, I love it. I feel like I'm totally in a room with you all, like the literal room. So this is, this is this like, <laughs> Oh. It's a good thing I'm wearing like a fluffy sweater. Like I'm just wearing a blanket. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's my favorite. And I, I always say that Angela just has a knack for bringing like like-minded souls to, and it always winds up. I often lately feel like I'm just transported into like a coffee shop with all of you and just like having a yarn and then the zoom ends and I'm like, oh no, I'm in this room. <laughs> it takes me a second. Like... So I love that that you feel like that here. And yeah, it's writer people are the best people, I'm convinced. (laughs) Agreed. Yeah. Now, did you, I I know this is on, this is not on the questions either, but I feel like I just am so nosy right now. But like when you were in theater, was poetry something you were always, you know, doing on the side? Did you ever like do, you know, where you were out speaking and and doing, you know, like... um, what is the term for like poetry? Like, oh, like spoken word. Spoken word. Thank you. My brain left the building. But like, oh, was that something that kind of like transitioned from theater to spoken word, or was that something you did? You know, I I teach spoken word all the time, but I've never done. I've never been. You know, I, it's never been part of my practice. Um, I think I I love it. I think it's fast. A lot of my poetry friends started with spoken words as as. Te- teenagers and I think it's such a cool entry into poetry some of the first poetry I ever remember reading was in uh you know fifth and sixth grade I remember writing a haiku about cherry blossoms and being so proud of it you know like it was it's like you know and I remember sitting in that class and I like drew a picture with it so it was actually like an early form broadside if you're familiar with that tradition it's like when you put art and poetry together um that's I actually edited now like big girl version of that um for projects with like incarcerated writers but um I just remember means you were proud of that poem um but yeah so most of it was like by hand another thing um I really love Nikki Grimes book which I've gotten to tell her um you know Bronx Masquerade just totally connected with me in middle school my really some of my first introduction to like free verse poetry um and like brought up like it like bridged it made me realize I could bridge poetry with like my internal mm-hmm. stuff that was going on at home and stuff like that um and then really I and then I kind of forgot about poetry I got into fiction I was writing fantasy and then I was writing like a YA novel for years throughout my entire like high school experience and then into 
college and then kind of drop that in my master's degree and went on to other things. Um, but I think it wasn't until grad, like uh, not grad school, but undergrad where I got introduced to contemporary poetry. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I love this. And then it wasn't until grad school that I just like figured out that the verse novel was a thing, even though Nikki Grimes book was the thing that I just didn't have language for it. I was like, oh, this is just like, a, you know, I, and now like, you know, having got that's like education, right? It like gives you language for things that you didn't quite know that were like existing that you already knew, but you didn't maybe have a term for it. And like, in that way, it's kind of hard to systematize things in order to like turn it into craft and create so that's like the beauty of education but also like me being like a little bit of like a rebel and like wanting to like decolonize education is like this should not yes. have to be a thing that you get through undergrad through a uh, graduate school like all this stuff right and so for me it's actually really important to include in saints like yes there it's more like free verse poetry but also there's like um, more like concrete poems, which are like poems in certain shapes and structures, mm -hmm. um, things that like can introduce young people to poetry that is maybe their jam and they just haven't been introduced to it yet. Um, and we kind of slowly build there throughout the book. And I tried to make it authentic to Max's voice, who's the the kind of the painter. So actually the poems start mimicking his paintings. Um, and so that's the way that we interact with that kind of new structure. So anyway, um, but I, yeah, so I don't know. I, like I said, I think that poetry came more quietly for me and it kind of snuck up on me and then kind of ended up being that quiet sacred space. Though I love teaching spoken word. I love getting students up, you know, upstanding and like reading their work. It's just so exciting. And I think oral storytelling is huge. So I tell people like, even if you've never been published, find a place to share your work, like, like go and share with your mom or go and like find some friends and read it because whether or not they like they might be bored or they might not be like but they need to experience that like we've lost that in our culture and we need to start making space and prioritizing those kinds of um storytelling structures which we've forgotten about um in our kind of western culture right that's so you know you need to be published you need to have this or this or that you know it's like no that's not that's never a thing i i read poems all the time that i've never published that i don't even want to try getting published i just you know i i just wrote this poem and i'm going to share it um so i try to make space for that too um just to have that as part of like the way that i exist in the world um and so it's not always about you know oh yeah she got a book deal you know like that kind of thing I try to make sure that my life is exhibiting at least some of those deeper beliefs that I hold mm, I mm. love that so much yeah. and just like in a really small way I've like been trying to give myself permission on social media to share little snippets and like poetry shaped things I wouldn't dare call them poetry yet but like that's really hard but the other day I realized I was like no, I really like this and I'm proud of it and it moves something in me and I want to give myself permission to share it even though it's not in a published book, it's not in a work, it might not even be a poem, but it felt like it moved something in me when I wrote it and I was like, I'm going to share it, you know? like <laughs> It's like it's so right, like there's these other parts of storytelling that aren't like restricted by just a book. I love yeah. that so much. Oh man, I'm getting chills listening to you guys and it, it Honestly, it reminds me so much of something my dad said when I told him, dad, you know, I sold my book because he's a poet and, you know, my grandfather was a poet and his thing was like, well, you know, it's, he's like, that's great, but you remember it's not about the money, right? Like, it's not what you do. The money's great. We're going to be happy about that. Yeah. It's not, about, you know, <laughs> like money. Thank you. Yes, please. But his whole thing is like, we don't do it for that. Remember mm -hmm. your why. And that's always something that sticks with me is remember your why. Because for him, you know, he published maybe, he published one little book my father did of mm -hmm. his poems. But other than that, he just has stacks of just him breathing on the page, you know, and stacks and stacks of all of these, his own like little tales of life. And, and to him, that's enough. And I think, like what Melanie's doing, just sharing these little bits of yourself and like decolonizing the idea of we got to hustle, make this money. Money's great, but also where is the art and the storytelling and like, you know, just elders or whoever telling these stories of their own lives. It's, it's beautiful. So, so thank you for 
Again, I just keep saying like, thank you for this because like just looking at it, like, it's so it's so pretty, it's so perfect. I I love that you said your dad was a poet. Um, my, and my dad would always, you know, he was like, "So funny, Ari, that when people ask you what you do, you say you're a poet." And he's like, and he loved it. He loved it because he thought it was really like. I, you know, I didn't think of it as like, you know, some, you know, spacey, you know, I'm poor kind of statement or something like that. He's like, you know, in his mind, he's probably thinking like, homegirl has like her master's degree, like it's teaching in a right. college, you know, like different things. Like she's got all this, stuff. and you know, you just, you know, somebody asks you what you do and you tell them that you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it wasn't something that I was like, hey, I like you know I, I just that's you know at your root who are you in that way and I, I and I didn't really realize it until he mentioned it and I'm like oh I guess that's fair dad but like you know <laughs> you lead with you are a poet because you know what that's amazing <laughs> I love it so much now can you tell us a little bit about your query submission process like what was your journey like to getting the book in print yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah, I am. Um, you know, I think in, in the way that, you know, we talk about community just in general being so good and the kid lit community is so magical. Um, I was, you know, I went to a master's program at Hamlin, which I now teach at um, for writing for children and young adults. And um, that 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 community was magical. It was so great. And I love it still. It's, it's still magical. Um, and I just, I'm like, oh, now I just get to go back and be on faculty and just have it forever as long as this works out. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so from there, I really, I met a lot of folks, a lot of faculty um, really uh, invested in me. Um, and, you know, they, they, they really did. They helped, you know, they referenced me to their agents or things like that, you know, and so it really kept the um, it kept the process pretty quick for me in the sense that I didn't, I had written a lot of books before that, but I never felt like any of them were the right one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, sometimes I say this, I'm like, if I would have started querying at 17 with all my books that I was so excited about, you know, I would have got my, my, my like query journey would probably sound very different, right? Like I'd probably have a lot of no's and I'd have all this, you know, and, but I, I think I just, and not that that's, any, you know, that's less or anything. It's just, this is the journey that I ended up taking. I ended up not submitting anything until I absolutely was sure about the book. And that meant that I'd written multiple different books um, and was now just feeling like, no, I think this is the one. And uh, and so for me, the agent came pretty quickly. I think I queried one agent and then she was a no, but she was like, she's like, I don't think I can edit this, but I think that you're gonna find the agent pretty fast. <laughs> like, and then after that, I think I queried just a few other folks. Um, and then ended up with a couple different offers, um, which was really kind of cool to get to talk to different people, right? Like that was really fun. Lots of different, lots of different perspectives and ideas on on writing. And you know, if money is important at the time, I was like, money is not important. And, and uh, as like you know, the the daydreamy poet. But now I'm like, now I see that. Oh no, Ari! Like if you are going to feed yourself and your family, like you do need to get paid for your work and. You know, I have different responsibilities now than I did when I was, you know, just married with, you know, married and we're living in a, you know, 800 square foot apartment in Minneapolis and you don't need that much, you know, but now it's like, okay, yeah, like probably, you know, if my child wants to go to college, it'd probably be a nice thing to help, uh, you know, basically like things like that where, you know, but so now I'm, I, 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 yeah, I think it was interesting talking to different agents and seeing what they valued and, the things that they, you know, thought about the manuscript. And anyway, I ended up with Sarah Crow at Pippin Properties and she just was absolutely fabulous. And a lot of my, um, a lot of my community is actually represented by her. So like Erin and Trotta Kelly and Nina LaCour and now Alana K. Arnold and the list can go on. I've And I've, and now it's kind of fun too, to look back and be like, there, she represents a lot of people that have been like my friends that I was able to like, you know, not because of me, but because you pass down what, you know, you help people when, you know, you've been helped. And so it's a hope, I always try to make it like a priority. If I believe in something like, and I like, uh, I'm excited about where this person's journey is going, like I will reference their work if they are, you know, if I've read it and I've experienced it in some way or another. Um, and help them move along through the query process because it can take a long time. Um, and that's okay. Like, that's a beautiful journey too. Like I said, it's, it's all about that intrinsic value anyway. Like speed is just what my story was, not a requirement for publishing a book, right? Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I, so I ended up signing with Sarah and then she and I worked on the book for probably, I want to say six months. Um, it was very spare. It was super thin. Uh, it was like 175 pages, but it was what wow. I knew that it was like the best I could do with my own tools. And yeah. then she was saying, literally, I love looking back at my notes and she actually did a presentation on it. Like what we ended up doing is like, she just asked me for more. Just like more, 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 because I'm underwriter. And so then I just got to lean into that. And now that's literally what I have in the back of my head when I write because I underwrite. I'm like, more, Ari, like you can put more in there. Like you're holding back and you can put more. <laughs> um, and that's just like, I would just say, if you're an underwriter, like go for it. Like sometimes I even joked once I was like, I wrote a short story and it was, I said it was a maximalist short story. And <laughs> Laura Ruby, who's like a Prince Award winning author was like, Ari, this isn't a maximalist. <laughs> like this is actually quite spare and I'm like okay never mind it's really relatable yeah right I'm like I really expanded on that and my first draft was 60k (laughs) that's hilarious I love it yep so just you know we we grow we get to know ourselves a little better and what works and more more is the key word here more more exactly um so yeah I guess I'm, I'm kind of going round about this story but then and eventually yeah we went on sub and I think we were probably on sub for six months or something like that too we got to revise and resubmit um from FSG with Grace Kendall and I really liked what she was saying and I liked the opportunity of trying something that I didn't have in my skill set yet mm-hmm. um I'm all about craft and like adding to things and you know doing weird weirdish like and, and trying out stuff like it was already in poetry and vignettes but what it was lacking was some of that like traditional plot structure um and so I needed to learn how to plot a bit more um and so whereas other other editors that were I ended up going to auction um but maybe other editors didn't necessarily have that perspective on it but I really wanted to do I wanted to learn <laughs> I wanted to and I felt like that could be the answer for the book And I really think it is. I think I'm so proud of this book. And so many people that that will reach out to me and be like, Ari, I'm not much of a reader or I'm not a fast reader. I was not a fast reader. Like I've always been a slow reader, still am. Um, Like proud of that. (laughs) Like, because I think I've had so many, so much shame for that for so many years that I'm like, no, we're just owning it, Ari. You're a slow reader. That's the way you work. Um, And, uh, but it's, yeah so it's but folks are telling me that even if they consider them slow readers they're like I got to page 40 or I got to you know or whatever like I got I'm moving through this book so fast like or I finished it in one night and like or I read it in six hours or you know like all this stuff where it's like um people are getting to finish it and I know the how great that feeling is when you get to finish something Um, and that's been really special to me like that 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 the book has been has gone that way but again it just came from really good editorial advice and um and really loving my editor I love working with Grace Kendall and it's just been an honor to get to work with her and she's just so smart and brilliant um I'm super like also really great at working with Indigenous writers like I I feel like she has such she's done her work if that makes sense which makes it a very safe place to exist in um which you need especially for your main book (laughs) right um and so that's that's been really special and I'm so grateful for relationship and the the, really my publishers have been so good by the book I just can't I'm so impressed by my whole team um they've really they've really taken care of it and taken care of me and I've been grateful that's that's so special and amazing but also you know don't you discredit you for wanting to learn more and to, you know, expand your own like knowledge and, uh, you know, and working and being willing to open yourself up and, and do the more, do the work. Right. Because, you know, so often you hear writers who are like, who will just flat out be like, no, I've, I've written a perfect story. This is what, <laughs> This is it. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm not being willing to expand and learn and you were open to it. And I think that's like, you know, I always, I call it like the craft of writing because really, or even like the practice of writing, right? Cause it's, you have to continue to learn and there's so much you can learn if you are open to it or not. And you know, you, 
you do fine. But, you know, I love the idea of you being open to that. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, just it's like a a testament to your heart and soul, which is just like, no, I want to do the work because I want to produce something that is worth it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. you did it. Oh, I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah, it it boggles my mind, though, the authors who like us completely rigid but want to be traditional published, traditionally published, like some stuff, obviously not negotiable, like depends Mm -hmm. what you're writing about, but like, yeah, I think like it's kind of part of being traditionally published. Like if you want your work to be widely felt and interpreted, I always think that like, I need other brains to go over it. Even just this morning, I wrote a message. I was like, Angela, can you please, I need another brain to confirm that this is being perceived the way I want it to be perceived. And I think that like, sometimes that's, that's why we need the team. <laughs> we need the other brains. <laughs> Absolutely. We do. We do. And, you know, and even, even part of this process of running scenes, really, I actually co-wrote a character and that's the language that I use. Um, Nicole is Anishinaabe Ojibwe, um, and I co-wrote her with my uh, cousins, and we spent time together and created her backstory. I wrote her arc, right? Like that was the, what I brought to the table. But also, even that, we wanted her to be a trickster because there's a lot of beautiful tricksters that are good in Anishinaabe culture that mm-hmm. reveal something about somebody. Um, mm-hmm. And to me, it's kind of like indigenous justice. It looks different than what our American justice system looks like. We have this other type of thing. And it's true in Ruby culture as well. We often have trickery that reveals the true heart or soul of somebody. And then that person has to deal with kind of the shame or the reveal or the community knowledge of, oh, I was wrong about this. Or they just, you know, for example, like chocolate. Uh, there's, we know about chocolate and she was the good sister in Brewery folklore. Um, there are three other types of chocolate that nobody really knows about that are totally in existence on my territory. And like chocolate comes from Central America. Like it's like, you know, our contribution to the world. Um, but there are other types of chocolate that we don't know about. And those were the evil sisters in our story. They were the ones that got turned into these other types of chocolate. Their legacy does not get to be known, but the good sister does, right? So like there are these things with trickery and, you know, all the transformation and all that stuff that I think is very true to ingenuity. Um, but anyway, it was really cool to, again, like collectively think about storytelling, say, I can't do this by myself. In fact, this would be wrong if I was going to write a character that's not in my experience she has similar experiences to me as an indigenous woman but not necessarily in terms of tribal identity um and you know so that kind of thing had to be totally built and co-written um and so yeah yeah it's like even that like my cast and my characters does not fully belong to me and that's good it should be that way um but I don't know I just I think I have more of a collective way of looking at it um but I also am like still like but I'm still the author I'm still you know I'm very much rooted in who I am but I'm totally, I think there needs to be space where we can start taking a little bit of our, um, all of the claim to the work that we do, um, because I think our best work can be done when we are acknowledging community and the ways that that affects who we are. Um, we don't exist in a vat, you know, like we, we exist in connection with people and that's why we create art, right? It's, it's, it's an exhibition of that connection. And so, uh, yeah, anyway, I could go on and on with my soapbox, but I, I love I love to think about art as communal often, um, even though it's sacred by ourselves as well, but it, it just has that, it, it's able to hold two things at once. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please, thank you. I agree. Like, don't, don't ever apologize. This is the podcast for long like winded explanations about creativity and craft and we're just like living for it (laughs) yeah we're just like listening we're just like yes whatever you have to say just say it because it's beautiful it's perfect and it's it's so true though because community really is like the fabric I feel like is what has kept me wanting to be in writing like honestly you know because it's hard to be a writer to be an author but when you have this community, these people that are just as excited about your work as you are, if not more excited, you know, it, it keeps you coming back and wanting to do it. And, um, and so I love that it, you wrote this in community, 
you know, on your own, but also in community. But um, mm -hmm. can you tell us actually a little bit about what your amazing book is about? Yeah, absolutely. Right. This is a scary question for writers. <laughs> Um, so I will do my best. Uh, but Saints of the Household is about two bravery brothers, Indigenous Costa Rican, um, that's our tribe. Um, and they are, they've grown up in an abusive household, and they've always depended on one another for survival. And um, this kind of gets turned sideways when they end up beating their cousin's boyfriend, uh, beating up their cousin's boyfriend in the woods. And now nobody knows really like why they did that and they're kind of turned into the community monsters because the boy in the woods was the star soccer player of Deer Creek Minnesota and uh so it kind of um it's about it's you know it's, it's about their healing journeys uh one Max is he's a, a artsy boy <laughs> he loves painting and art and all that stuff and so he manifests as poetry on the page and then um, Jay is, he's got a very mathematical brain. He loves to pay attention to the world in kind of like deep, heavier ways. He really pays attention to his emotions. And he, um, so, and he also, you know, is, is, is just kind of that type of, type of kid. And so he, he manifests as kind of vignettes or like short form. So sometimes it's like paragraphs, sometimes it's a full page or two pages. Um, and that's his section. So I kind of call those vignettes for the most part. Um, and then, yeah, so that's a good, that's their, their journey and their healing journey through, you know, kind of growing up through grappling with being, growing up in abusive households, PTSD, depression, situational depression, all that stuff. Um, but really it's also about kinship and relationality and community and intertribal connections and, arts and all that kind of stuff, faith and healing all that all that good stuff as well um so yeah that's 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 my that's my shtick on the book <laughs> yes mic drop it sounds incredible and like I love all the kind of the deeper mental health type themes that it sounds like you've threaded through it I'm like mm -hmm. all for that because those kind of deeper intricacies like that's always what draws me to like why a character moves and like what's their motive and their reasoning behind stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I'm seeing our time. I'm sorry. I'm seeing our time is like slowly dwindling or quickly. I don't know how it <laughs> happened, how we've been on here this for this amount of time. It's amazing. It's just like evaporated. But I want to ask, like, what has been the most rewarding part of this experience for you? Oh, yeah. I think meeting teenagers. That has been, I've been traveling, you know, over the last month here and meeting teenagers and, you know, it's not being able to like sneak a book to a few, you know, young people or native girls or something that couldn't buy the book, you know, like that kind of stuff just means a lot to me. I, um, or, or, you know, young people coming up to me and being like, hey, like this is, this is, cause I'm pretty open about things. Like I grew up in a pretty abusive space. I don't go into detail, but I at least share that often with young people. Cause sometimes that's what they need for permission in order to be able to share and speak, speak out on things. And so, um, you know, having young people come up to me and be like, ah, yes, me too, you know? Um, and that's really, um, really special and spectacular. And so it's where the the book kind of meets reality um, with young people. Also adults reading it, they it's like they're tending to some of their childhood wounds. So people will say, I've read it and I realized I haven't really processed this part of my kidhood. Um, and I need to tend to that now. Um, and I'm like, well, sorry, sorry that I brought things up, but maybe also, maybe it's good. Maybe we all, you know, maybe it's a space towards healing, a step towards healing. Um, so that's been, that's been spectacular, connecting with an audience. Um, but the young people especially are making my heart grow. That's so beautiful. Yes, and that's one of the things I love about young adult novels in particular is for one, obviously the kids, it's perfect, but for all of us adults who are still <laughs> still learning and like needing to look back and kind of be like, okay, this is touching something I didn't realize that I haven't healed yet. And um, and that's why I, I always and to lean towards young adult because I feel like I'm always learning something from young adult novels which is you know everybody has their opinions but if they're wrong if they say you adults shouldn't read <laughs> adult novels they're wrong that's their opinions wrong 
A hundred percent. I agree with you. <laughs> That's I agree with you. That's so powerful. Like it's literally like planting the seeds of change in people, you know, like, and yeah. And I think it's why a lot of us come to story. I do see our time has evaporated. I have to ask before it completely goes, do you have a favorite quote that like you kind of always reflect on or one that you live by or anything? <laughs> yeah, it's to chase the joy. And it's really hard to do that sometimes, to be honest, right? Uh, it's really hard. Um, but also to, to, to figure out what it takes. And I've talked to other authors about this and some have to go out and write in the woods by hand. You know, for me, it might mean writing in a different space or actually taking my crappy laptop and writing it instead of my pretty desktop that I thought I was just going to get to write all of my novels on. Um, and I find that that's where I find the joy um, or reading poetry or reading the books that I want to read <laughs> instead of the books that I'm getting told to read. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff is chasing the joy. Um, finding my community that can help me make that space um, and values it with me. Um, that's another thing. Uh, so yeah, chasing the joy, I think it's really what I try to lean into and it manifests differently, but it, it, it changes all the time, but that's, that's, but it's still true, right? Each time, right? It's true each time, no matter where you are in your life, how can I chase the joy of this? Um, and make sure I'm prioritizing that. Wow. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, before we're cut off, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And just blessing us with your magic. And, um, and you know, I'm just going to thank you from the rest of the world that's going to read your book. You know, thank you for putting this out there into the world. Mm. Thank you both for having me. Yeah, it yeah. was a real honor. And yeah, total kindred spirit. And yeah, I love your quote. It is, it gave me chills all over my body. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much true honor to chat this morning and yeah it's like a big warm hug <laughs> yes okay. well, we're gonna get cut off so thank you again you're the best you're amazing i can't say enough good things about you so <laughs>